Okay, everybody, I think we're going to get started now. Um, welcome to all of our panelists and our attendees. Um, my name is Amy Slattery. I am the budget director for um, Borough President Mark Levine, Manhattan Borough President Mark Levine, and we thank you all for joining us. He's going to hop on um, himself to say a few words. So whenever he does, if I don't see him, if someone can let me know, and then we'll we'll resume our our presentation. But uh, before that, I'm just going to uh, let uh, the, uh, the other panelists introduce themselves, and we can pass it on to the next. So again, I'm Amy Slattery. I'm the budget director for the Manhattan Rural President. I will pass it on next to Nelson. Nelson Andino, Deputy Director of Capital and Budget with Amy. Hi, everyone. My name is Maite Carino, and I'm the Capital Projects and Budget Analyst. Okay, well, I'll pass it on to David. David. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Dave Lachance. I'm an attorney at OMB Council's office. Um, OMB is the Office of Management and Budget for the city. Okay, um, sorry, I can't see everybody. Uh, Mason, we'll pass it on to you next. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mason Hess. I'm a vice president in uh, the NYC EDC Funding Agreements Department. And NYC EDC, of course, is the uh, New York City Economic Development Corporation. Great. Um, okay. Uh, next, uh, Darren, can you can you say hi? Hi, Darren Brannon, Department of Cultural Affairs. Uh, I will also be joined by the director of the Capital Unit, Angela Blocker, momentarily. Awesome. Awesome. Do we have any other agency reps here? We have uh, Robert from HPD. Robert, unmute. Apologies. Hey everyone, my name is Bobby. Um, I'm an analyst in the Division of Capital Planning at HPD. And as easy it, our assistant commissioner should be joining in a few moments. Okay. We also have um, some representatives from a few uh, nonprofits who have been successful awardees, but I think we'll we'll introduce them when they do their presentations because we have been joined by our, our Manhattan Borough President, so I'm going to cue it over to him, Mark Levine, to say a few words of welcome. Well, thank you so much, Amy, and hello, everyone. I'm so grateful our city agency partners are joining us, and I'm really happy to see we have over 130 nonprofit participants on this Zoom. To all of you who are leading and running nonprofits in Manhattan right now, thank you, thank you, thank you. This is a, a challenging time for the city in many ways and a tough time to be running a nonprofit. And we need you more than ever. We need you helping New Yorkers, whether it's education, healthcare, economic development, culture, all the ways that you enhance the borough. I also know that uh, fiscally, this is a challenging time to lead a nonprofit. And personally, I believe that it's moments like that where you actually need to double down on capital investment to compensate for turbulent economic times. And I'm, I'm hoping we can do that as a city in this budget. Certainly we'll do everything we can with our office to achieve that goal. And it's something we're very proud of being able to do, to invest directly in capital projects, in nonprofits throughout the borough, whether uh, it is economic development or healthcare or equity or climate and resilience. Um, those are priorities that really matter to this office. I'll also say that we're not the biggest source of capital money. Um, clearly the city council has a large pot, relevant city agencies uh, on the mayor side, but boy, it's, it's, it's really so effective when all of us can go in together when you can have borough president, the city council, and if it's DCLA or another city agency. Um, and it, it, sends a, it sends a message to private donors too. So I, I think that we matter because of the money we can put in, but also we matter because of our ability to put that kind of, of collective investment across different city entities. Anyway, I'm really excited you guys are here. You're gonna hear from great experts. And we just look forward to getting all your applications in the months ahead. So thanks for coming out today. Good luck, everybody. 
Thank you, BP Levine. Um, uh, okay, great. So I think we're gonna get started now. If we could go back to the presentation, my day. Just cue the PowerPoint. Okay, beautiful. Here we go. Um, okay, so uh, this is a we we did this is a presentation today for the uh, capital application process through our office. We'll touch it. We'll, we'll touch upon a little bit about the city council and um, Department of Cultural Affairs as well. But um, for our office, for nonprofit organizations and for city agencies, we did a presentation for public schools about a week ago. So if you're a school, this won't really apply to you. And um, we recorded that presentation so we can, um, you know, we can get you access to that webinar. But, um, you know, the, again, this is for nonprofits and we welcome well, uh, and agencies and we welcome you here. Uh, yes. OK, great. Next slide. Maite, got it. Okay, great. So here's the agenda of what we're going to cover. We just we just did our intros. Um, I'm going to talk some about the capital funding guidelines for nonprofits and city agencies, and that's that's in general, but also it's going to be specific to our office and our application process. And so that leads us to the next bullet point, which is CAP grants, which is the application um, that nonprofit organizations fill out, um, which is the which is um, OMB or Office of Management and Budgets, it's their application, um, but all nonprofits need to fill that out and you use that to apply to both um, the borough president's office, the city council, to DCLA, et cetera. Um, and then we'll talk specifically about for city agencies, our separate application, um, which um, like parks groups and um, uh, uh, bids, um, Etc. So organizations that want to apply for libraries for um, city agency funding through our office, we have a separate application for that. Um, we're then going to turn it over to two uh, prior um, grant recipients from our office, uh, Biobus and Westside Federation for Senior and Supportive Housing, or Wishfish, um, to just kind of do a brief uh, presentation on on their project and you know, some of the things that uh, either they found challenging or, or um, you know, wins in the process. Um, we're then going to have um, David from OMB uh, share his screen and talk a little bit and even walk you through a little bit of CAP grants, which is their, their application database. And then over to EDC, Mason will talk about um, their project management and steps and then we're going to try to leave as much time for Q and A because I know that's really the you know the the most important time for you is to be able to get access to our agency reps and also us to be able to ask specific questions. So, all right, next slide. Okay, so capital funding. These are just some summer you know a summary of some of the baseline requirements for a nonprofit organization. First and foremost, you need to be a nonprofit registered under New York state law, and uh, you must be registered to do business in New York state. Um, this is an important one specifically for smaller and or newer organizations. You have to have city operating contracts for previous fiscal years. Um, for real property, you have to have existing um, operating or expense contracts with the city, and those can come in various forms. They could come from discretionary funding or other um, other uh, awards you get directly from the city for the three previous fiscal years of at least fifty thousand dollars. So that would be fiscal year. We're we're talking about fiscal year twenty five, which is approaching. So the fifty thousand dollars in operating funds must have come in. Uh, minimum uh, in FY24, 23, and 22. For movable property, and we're going to give some examples of each of these in a second, Appl um, applicants must have a contract with the city for operating funds in the previous year of at least $25,000. And if I haven't said all of that entirely correct, 
I know David will um, David will um, give all the 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 correct details. Um, you have to show an operating history uh, with, of your organization. By that we mean you have to demonstrate that you have sufficient financial resources to support your project throughout the its useful life. Um, you'll be asked to provide budget information um, and other other items in order to do that. You have to provide audited financial statements for the previous three fiscal years. And one important thing that we want to point out is that funding won't be provided to startup organizations, organizations with no current or paid full-time staff, um, organizations that can't demonstrate a history of operating the services that they propose to operate. And um, this next statement is important because we do have a lot of organizations that do have perhaps a religious component um, or maybe operate in a church or a house of worship. Um, funding from the city cannot be used to advance sectarian activity, including but not limited to religious worship, instruction, and proselytizing. And if you do have specific questions about your organization, maybe you do have a charitable component that is operated in, within or adjacent to or in relation to a house of worship, and you, you have a specific question about your project, we can try to answer that um, in this, in the Q&A. Okay, next. Okay, so there are some exceptions and these are just a few of them. There are more. And if you see at the bottom of this slide, um, there is a link to the um, capital eligibility guidelines. And I should mention that we'll be distributing, not in, in addition to recording this webinar, we're going to be distributing this PowerPoint to all who have RSVP'd. Um, so back again to the exceptions. Some of the exceptions are for housing projects. Um, some the, the specific type of housing loan program from HBD might stipulate specific requirements. And some loans might allow for community and common area upgrades. Um, HPD will be able to elaborate on that a little bit more. Um, cultural organizations, organizations that receive funds from DCLA in, in the previous fiscal years of 21, 22, 23, or 24, um, there are some exceptions to the operating funds requirements. And if you're a first time recipient of cultural development funding, which is CDF. Last year, you should reach out to DCLA and um, run through the project with them. And there's an email there if you don't have your project manager's uh, contact information readily available. Okay, next slide. Uh, okay, so these are some of the types of eligible projects. There's really nothing new here, but we're happy to run through them. Um, so there's real, pro we refer to real property, which is acquisition, construction, or reconstruction of lands, land buildings and fixture, fixtures. There's movable, pro movable personal property, such as equipment or vehicles that is not attached to real property. Real property is a building or land in any manner or is very minimally attached. And some specific examples are land and building acquisition and renovations theater renovations or equipment purchases, uh, building HVAC system, vehicle purchases, and outfitting of new spaces. And thank you to everyone, by the way, for dropping your initial questions or comments into the Q&A. We're gonna be monitoring that throughout, and then we will, all, we will be um, trying to answer as many of those questions, if not all of them, at the end of the presentation. So, okay, next slide. Okay, so this is important to, to bear in mind that an eligible eligible project must have a city purpose and a defined city use uh, to provide a public benefit for its useful life. That's because the city is investing their dollars into projects that further benefit the citizens of the city of New York. And therefore they need to invest their dollars wisely um, so um, everything they give has to survive the whole, the entire length of the project. And a useful life, in terms of useful life, the project must adhere to at least a minimum useful life and which and and a city purpose for its entire useful life. 
So for instance, a minimum useful life for equipment is three to five years and tends to be about 10 to 30 for, for equipment and 10 to 30 years for construction and renovation. And you must meet the directives of the New York City Comptroller's Office. And again, these eligibility criteria are all in the, um, the web link that we post to the previous slide. So in addition to that, you must meet the minimum city contribution. Okay, so the amount that you're asking for must meet a minimum from the city must meet a minimum amount. So for real projects of land and building, it must be at least $50,000, $500,000, I'm sorry. For movable, movable property and equipment, it must be at least $50,000. And for minimum minimally attached, it must be $250,000. And we just, we like to point out here that all construction renovation projects must have a 15% contingency amount built into the budget that you have to provide. Okay. Okay, here's some other require, requirements or just, you know, things that we like to point out. Um, private schools um, where 100% of students are um, special education students with disabilities and their tuition is covered by the Department of Education, so reimbursed to the parents when they pay it, those schools are eligible to apply. We like to point out that funds are made only on a reimbursement basis. Um, if you're awarded a $500,000 uh, capital award, you're not given $500,000 to then go out and spend. Um, it's a very, um, the, the contracting process is very specific and um, either the city is going to do the work for you or they're going to reimburse you. Um, and we can give more specific examples of that if you have questions. But the city will, re we also like to point out the city will only reimburse for eligible costs that have incurred after the date of the city appropriation. So any work that's been done before is not eligible. And, and that does, um, you know, that does play into some long-term projects. Um, so we like to point that out. Um, and the city will not fund any recipients that have not complied with prior city agreements. So if you're, um, if you have an existing project award that is, um, you know, you're having issues with and it's not moving forward for various reasons and you're applying for something new, um, the city's really going to scrutinize not only what you're applying for, but what's going on with your, with your prior award and make sure that you're up to date, um, on your status reports and you know everything you have to with that project as well. So though there's other there's other examples which I think we have on the next slide. I'll cue the next slide. Oh, okay. So here's some examples of ineligible items just to give you some context. And like I said, these are just some of the um, examples. But um, and a lot of these are because they just don't meet the the definition of capital, either because they don't meet the minimum dollar amount or useful life. But I'll run through them. Uh, mobile devices, maintenance or support services, that doesn't qualify as capital. Warranties that have separate line item costs associated with them. Anything that's dispensable or consumable, like paper, toner, et cetera, et cetera. Smaller items. Inventory and supplies or backup items. Anything that's custom made or custom fabricated with um, decals or logos um, are not considered eligible. And if you have a specific question why, we can explain that. Um, maintenance type equipment like vacuums or um, snow blowers or leaf blowing machines we have on here. Again, those most likely, those don't meet them, the minimum dollar threshold. Um, carrying cases and storage, and then software subscription with ongoing fees. Software license, and, but we do like to point out that software licenses are cap or can only be capitally eligible when they're valid for five years after the initial purchase, because many times they are not. Okay. Next. Okay. So how do I apply for capital funding? If you've applied before, you most likely know this, but whether you have or you have not, um, we like to kind of walk you through this. So if you're a nonprofit organization, you have to apply via cap grants. And you'll see that we have um, a link 
to the CAP grants page right here. And as I said before, David from OMB is going to walk through CAP grants, um, which is a very user friendly, but yet, you know, there's a lot of a lot of bits and pieces that go um, go into the application. Um, so step one is you have to set up your account and you have to conceptualize your project, which is, you know, obvious, but does, you know, still worth worthy of saying. Um, we do um, do meetings with every organization that requests one from our office um, and within the next week, but certainly before the holidays. We are going to on our web page uh, are the the BP's funding tab on our website. We are going to post a link to a meeting request form where you can request a 30 minute meeting with the budget team where you can walk us through your projects. <clears throat> ask any questions that you have specific to, to your project and or any technical issues you might be having that we can help you with. So we encourage you to do that. Um, we set aside a lot of time um, to do those meetings and we'll we'll do them starting in January. And we tend to do them all the way through March. Um, step two is to submit your request and make sure that you actually hit submit. Um, if you have an incomplete application, we're not gonna be able to review it. Um, it won't be reviewed or accepted by OMB. <laughs> and you should be aware that if you make any changes to the application, like a project location or the type of um, the project itself, um, it, you, you'll have to you have to submit a new application. And step three um, happens after you submit, where both OMB and the BP's office we review your application for a number of things, including eligibility. Um, and um, what we will do as an office is um, when or if OMB reviews your application and they have comments or questions or need supplemental information, we consistently log on to CAP grants. And from our view, we can see all those comments and questions and requests for more, more information. And we're the conduit to communicate with you to let you know that information. So um, we should be reaching out to you proactively. I'll say that if you haven't heard from us, um, you maybe it would be a good idea not to assume that you there are that there are no issues, and you can preemptively reach out to us and re reach out to us and just say, "Hey, is everything okay with our application? Are there any issues?" Are, you know, have we cleared? Are we deemed eligible? Do you need, you know, are you needing anything from us? We're we're happy to help. And then <clears throat> we, as the BP's office, we submit an initial round of applications in um, to OMB in March. I should mention before that that our deadline for applying is this year. It is February twenty second at five p.m. No exceptions. Um. And <clears throat> sorry, so once that happens and we review all the application, as long as it's in, even if there are follow-ups that needs to happen that need to happen, it's okay. You just have to have the application submitted by the deadline. We'll follow up with you. Then we do a first round of um, recommendations for awards in March. Then um, once the executive budget comes out, we get our final number. We know exactly how much we definitively have to give out in awards. And then we finalize um, our grants awards in late April, early, early May. And then we notify you once the city budget passes by the end of June, and we'll notify you over the summer in July, August timeframe. Okay, next. <clears throat> okay. So um, the application process for city agencies, this is different. We've been talking really only up to this point about nonprofit organizations. If you're a city agency, like a library or um, one of the public hospitals, the h, &H hospitals, the parks department, or a friends of uh, parks organization that has an operating agreement with the parks department, you will be applying to us as a city agency, which does not need to go through CAP grants. And it goes through our Manhattan Borough President's Office created application, which you can find on our website in the capital funding tab, which we also have a link to. Um, 
So yeah, and that so like I said, that goes through our grants portal system, which is going to be opening probably at this point late December. We say mid December, but we're already there, so it's going to be late December. And that deadline is the same as the nonprofits deadline. It is February twenty second, five p.m. No exceptions. Next, okay. Here's just some tips um, from our office and just some other insight. I, I'd like to share um, a good way to, you know, stay in communication from our office and to get notifications is to sign up for our um, from for our newsletters and other communications from our office via our website, which is noted right there. We encourage you not to only apply to funding from us because we have. Um, a small amount, but the city council has a lot more capital funding. So you should also be applying to your local city council member um, and or the Manhattan delegation or the city council speaker. There's various bigger pools of capital funding. And um, we encourage you to develop relationships with your council members and your state elected officials. The state process is, is something entirely different. Um, so you should reach out to them to talk about that. And you should also apply to the city, specifically for cultural um, organizations, you should be applying to DCLA. And <clears throat> more often than not, we fund projects together. The VP might put in a piece, the council will put in a piece, and DCLA will put in a piece. We encourage you to complete your application as early, to complete and submit your application as early as possible. So we have one, you know that it's you know that that it's been received by the system, so there's no last minute you know panics or crises. But two, so we have enough time to go back and forth with you in case there's any you know missing items or items that need clarification. And as we mentioned before, there are no exceptions to that February twenty second deadline. And um, our website, which is listed at the top of the the slide. Um, has a lot of this information um, about um, including past uh, capital awards that we've made. So you can see ideas of like the kind of the dollar range of awards that we make and some examples of projects that we funded in the past. Okay, next. More tips. Like I said before, you're not only welcome to request a meeting with us, you're encouraged to. And you can request a meeting via the um, meeting request form that will be posted to our website um, very, very soon. Um, another thing we like to, to mention is that if you have a previous award and you are looking to repurpose those funds, you need to um, let us know about that. Um, you should reach out to us ASAP and we should discuss that. Um, and then we need to do what we need to do on the back end with, with OMB and the other agencies because it needs to be approved. Um, we ask <clears throat> applicants to only submit one application. We have a limited amount of capital funds. Um, it's allocated to us through a formula that's um, stipulated by the city charter. Um, I like to mention that um, each borough is allocated a specific amount that's um, based on the geographic size of the borough and the population of the borough. Manhattan um, gets the fourth lowest amount of uh, capital to, to appropriate. So um, that's why we ask you to only submit one application. So submit uh, what your number one priority is. And, and also to reiterate that you should be seeking funding, not just from this office. Um, if you're out in an event and you see someone else from the BP staff and you um, you really want to talk about your project with them, that's great. But um, unless you're talking to us, um, that information probably won't get to us. And we're the ones that are reviewing the applications and the ones that are making recommendations to the borough president on which projects to fund. So if you speak to someone outside of our unit, make sure you're also speaking to someone in within our unit. And finally, as I've said numerous times now, you know all of your elected officials. So you know all the various people that you can be reaching out to and asking for support. Okay. Here are links to more um, for other resources. Um, we have some from DDC and DCLA. 
Um, it would, again, we're going to distribute this and um, they'll be, you know, they're here for questions as well. And next slide. Okay. This is also very important. This is all of our contact information from the VP's office. Um, my information, um, Nelson's and Maite's, you have our emails and our phone numbers. I would say email is, is best. So I encourage you to reach out that way first. And next, okay, so next we are going to, before we move on to Q&A and also before we hear from a few of our agency reps directly, we are going to move it on to some prior grant recipients for them to share their experience. And assuming uh, ready, we're gonna start with Biobus and Sasha, I believe you're gonna be doing the presentation. Yes, so, that's welcome. correct, okay. and I'm good to go. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, thank you. Um, I will just quickly get this presenting. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Sasha. I'm the Executive Development Officer at Biobus um, and have known Nelson and Amy and the borough president Levine for a while now because you all have been very supportive of us both with actual funding and working through the capital process. Um, so I'm just going to go over a little bit of um, our experience. Um, so we've had capital funding for a variety of projects. Um, one of the things we've had recently is um, funding for a truck that has um, a cap and a lift. Um, so this truck is both able to tow our Airstream trailer mobile lab um, and transport our standalone science stations. And I've got a fun little video so you can see how that actually works. This is actually kind of like one of the original tests. Um, summer 2022 when we first got this and we're all super excited to see how we can more easily move the science stations. Um, and so what this does, it's a truck. It looks like, okay, it's a vehicle, um, but it's a really powerful vehicle that allows us to bring hands-on science experiences through our mobile and pop-up labs to um, kids of all ages across the city and really like bring all of this directly to them. Uh, wants to play again. <laughs> um, and so a big part of that is the science stations that we then need to transport. This is one of our original science stations on display at a pop-up lab. Um, and then we are just about to get a new round of science stations um, thanks to city funding. Um, the photo on the right is like the basically almost ready science stations um, that the manufacturer sent us and they're just waiting to have microscopes put on them basically. Um, and then one of our newer projects is actually capital funding for our mobile lab. So the photo on the left is um, our second mobile lab, the Airstream that that truck again helps to tow. And the photo on the right is um, the latest designs for um, a new mobile lab that we hope to have on the road, like in the next maybe six months even, maybe closer to a year. So um, city capital funding has been incredibly helpful for us and also not without any challenges. Um, I don't think anyone at BioBus had been through the city capital process prior to our organization applying. So we've all really been learning over the years how it works. Um, some of the challenges we had are pretty simple, like getting prepared to respond to requests from OMB um, during the application process that can be pretty time sensitive. Um, I think Amy was mentioning some of that and we've gotten a lot better, I think, at like being ready to respond to those things and knowing that there will be follow-up questions. Um, Navigating the contracting process, since we hadn't had capital awards before, was, of course, something we had to learn how to do and um, learn about the timing there and everything. Um, BioBus is a citywide organization, and the majority of our programs are mobile in some way. So just like the examples I was showing, our science stations are mobile labs. So 
the vehicles are able to go into multiple boroughs, which can sometimes be a little tricky with capital funding because it's usually borough specific and we need to identify the borough where a vehicle is going to park and where it's primarily going to be used because the elected officials for that borough are primarily interested in funding it. So that's just been like kind of one of those little pieces that we've had to think a little bit about, okay, what's the best way to think about where we're using these vehicles that will make us eligible for this very helpful source of funding and define things um, in like the right way. Um, and then one of the maybe like more interesting challenges we've had is that I think the vehicles and equipment that we are often um, aiming to purchase are a bit unique. And it's been interesting to go about like describing them effectively in our capital applications so that OMB understands what they are and understands that they meet the requirements. Um, and this is just like a fun graphic of one of the times that we were doing that and demonstrating how the microscopes are actually attached to our stations and attached to our vehicles um, so that like we could demonstrate that we were meeting the rules and the requirements for capital funding. Um, so, I mean, that's a list of challenges, but overall this has been incredibly successful for us. Um, we've had capital funding through like various folks at the city level for many years now. Um, and it's really, city capital funding has become a major source of capital funding for our organization as a whole. Um, we're able to really rely on the city often to provide capital funds that then we can complement with private funding for operating expenses. So um, seeking private support to pay our drivers who drive the mobile labs and the truck and the staff who manage the capital projects and our community scientists who run the programs. Um, and I think Borough President Levine was mentioning this, we've absolutely seen that our private funders are really excited to hear that the city is providing that capital support and it really motivates um, some of our other funders to come in with the operating support. So that's been a really nice mix for us. And because of that, city capital has really become a part of our regular funding plans and we're pretty much consistently thinking about throughout the year as we think about our capital needs. Um, we're thinking about the city capital timeline, when the applications will open and like what the right timing is to bring different projects to the city and seek funding. Uh, so that's the summary. Um, I just have contact information here for myself and Ben, our executive director, who's also worked on these projects extensively. Um, that's it, I think. Okay, thank you. Uh, that was that was great. And if um if anyone has a specific question for Biobus that you'd like to drop in the chat, feel free, and um we can address that in the Q and A. Um, so next we are going to turn it over to Jenna from uh, Wishfish. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Does that work? Great. <clears throat> um, okay, so um, hi everyone, I'm Jenna Brimas. Uh, I'm the real estate development director at Wisfish. <laughs> oh, right, let me just set a timer so I can keep track of what's happening here. Um, Westside Federation for Senior and Supportive Housing. Um, we are an almost 50 year old not for profit located on the Upper West Side. We develop supportive housing for seniors in Manhattan. Uh, and also in the South Bronx. Um, so we do the development, we provide property management and social services for all of our buildings. Um, I've been at Wisfish for about two years and previously I was at uh, the housing department at HPD uh, where I oversaw a capital funding program and experienced the funding process sort of on the other side, helping uh, developers like Wisfish um, and other types of developers to bring the capital funds into their projects. Um, so. I'll be providing some sort of tips that uh, for, for folks based on some of what I saw when I was at HPD too. Um, okay, so, uh, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about our project uh, with Fish at 108th Street. 
um, which we are very proud of. The building has been fully open and operating for about two years. It includes 199 apartments, 60% of which are supportive, a 110 bed homeless shelter, a garage for Central Park ambulances, a community room that can be used by the community and a federally qualified health center run by the Institute for Family Health. Um, so let's see, I can provide a little history of the project for those of you who may remember it was pretty controversial uh, when we were in the process of developing it. So this street was, the street used to have three city owned parking garages on it. And then our um, homeless shelter Valley Lodge for seniors was in the middle of that. Um, and so the site location is that, so the two sites of the project are outlined in red. So this was city owned property. So it had to go through Euler. So, you know, housing projects that are applying for capital funds sort of have this um, uh, development timeline that the Resa Way process really works well with. And particularly if you are going through um, the public disposition process through Euler, if you have an even longer sort of clock with which to sort of plan out your funding. Um, and it gives you the opportunity for, for um, HPD funded projects to potentially apply for uh, for res away for these discretionary funds a few years in a row because um, these uh, development projects, particularly if they're going to go through Euler, can take a very long time. So Wisfish started working on this project way back in 2009. Um, it took us a long time to develop the concept and then get the city on board. Um, and get a commitment to dispose of the city owned property to us. Um, and then it had to go through ULERP. So we finally began construction almost 10 years after we first started thinking about the project. Um, and then it took uh, about two and a half years for construction to be completed. And then this is our uh, ribbon cutting that the, bur that the borough president was at. Um, while the project was controversial initially, it is now um, really popular and, and the community is really happy with it. Um, so, so um, one thing that's interesting about our 108th Street project is that uh, we did apply for ResoA from the borough president at the time, who was Gail Brewer. We were awarded ResoA for the housing project. However, um, because of the way that housing projects work, we were actually able, and it was such a long process, we ended up not needing the, that ResoA award for the 108th Street project. And so we actually got permission um, from the borough president, who then I think became a council member during that interim, to move that ResoA award from the 108th Street project to another project um, in her district, um, the Independence House project. So that's something that, and in my time at HPD, that is something that I had seen projects, uh, seen developers do um, at various points in time. It's not ideal and it's definitely something that you need to communicate with everybody about, but because of this very long time frame um, that the housing projects have and the fact that things can change over time, um, there I've, I probably I've definitely seen it happen, you know, more than a few times where something changes and an initial um, discretionary award doesn't really make sense for that site anymore, but there's a new project that needs the award. And so they usually have that ability to move the project usually happens um, as part of a conversation with the city agency, with HPD, um, with your elected official, um, and sometimes with city council budget or with the budget office. Um, so so I think, you know, particularly for housing projects and, you know, Amy mentioned this too, that it's so important to keep, um, you know, to keep the borough president's office in the loop and for housing projects, because they have such a long timeline, um, it's really important to meet with your elected officials in advance, keep them up to date on what you're thinking about. Um, you know, you may, it may be like a number of years before your project is gonna get built, but, you know, elected official, most elected officials in New York City are very supportive uh, you know, of affordable housing projects. They want to know what's going on in their district. And, you know, if you're going to need a lot of support from them, you know, you want to get them in the loop and start sort of talking that through with them. 
Um, um, and then, you know, as Amy suggested, also take a look at the data that's available online to get a sense of how big the awards are that they typically fund. Um, and then you should also be coordinating with, with HPD. Um, once you have a, a assigned a project manager, you want to be talking to that project manager. Um, and, you know, HPD will want to know when you have applied for ResOA and they'll want to know um, sort of what you've described uh, as being the use of the funds. Uh, my advice is to keep the description of how the funds are going to be used as general as possible. If it's a new construction project, the description can be quite general uh, because you want to make sure that you are, that the use of the funds is capitally eligible and most of your project will be. So you don't want to screw things up by describing some, some portion of the project that isn't capitally eligible. And you can confirm that with your elected officials budget folks and also with HPD. Um, and then the other thing to think about uh, with HPD fundings is that, you know, you want to make sure that the, that it's, that it's uh, feasible for you to have to get access to the funds. So whereas the, um, the, the process for um, other organizations to get access to public funds, you know, probably goes through DDC and is sort of on a different timeline. Typically, the ResOA funds for, for HPD projects will come through to the project as part of your overall HPD finance closing. So you want to make sure that that lines up. A lot of HPD finance closings happen in June. So you don't want to apply for a project and get the award in July after you've already expected to close, because that means you're not going to be able to have access to that money unless you do a second finance closing, which is a ton of work for you. It's going to cost you money and it's a ton of work for the city agency. Um, and then my final word of advice is make sure you confirm that you actually get the ResOA award. Um, I've seen <laughs> more than a few times where you know, there are organizations that have great relationships with their elected official. The elected official tells them that they're going to get an award. They sometimes have even gotten, you know, a letter or an email, you know, before the fiscal year is over, say, confirming that they will be getting an award. But the money isn't there until somebody goes into the city's financial management system in the new fiscal year and confirms that it's actually there. Sometimes things happen at the last minute. Sometimes there are errors in the system. And um, you, know, you need to make sure that the money is actually there in July in the new fiscal year. Um, so you know, a letter from your elected official isn't enough. Um, and I've also seen the mistakes get corrected in the following fiscal year, but you'll really need to just confirm that. Um, so let's see, I think that those are my words of advice. Um, I think that's it for me. Okay, thank you so much. Um, that was really helpful. Um, all of those uh, experiences are, I'm sure, um, applicable and useful to a lot of groups that are on this on this uh, webinar. So thank you. Um, so now, David, if you're ready, I understand you want to walk a little bit through cap grants for the lucky people here. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Amy, and, and thank thanks you. everyone um, going before me for presenting and to my other city uh, agency partners who are on the call today. And thanks to all of you for joining and um, you know taking a proactive step as you are starting the application FY25 process. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, please let me know, Amy and Nelson, if this is working. You can see what I'm looking at. OK. Um, this is the CAP Grants main landing page. Uh, I believe this was put in the chat a few minutes ago or maybe, uh, you know, before some of the, the recent um, presentations. Um, but some of you may be familiar with this page if you've applied before. This is the main landing page for CAP Grants. You can find this by Googling NYC CAP Grants. I think it's linked on the Borough President's page. It definitely gets linked from the City Council page at some point too. Um, so it's all over the internet. Uh, this is 
still up, uh, you know, it's still not updated for FY25, but I can tell you that we intend to update this page um, by the end of next week, uh, and it will have a bunch of new information on there. Um, most importantly, it will have the submission deadlines that Amy mentioned before, but I will just repeat them here uh, so everybody has them down, and also um, understanding that many of you will probably apply for council funding, um, you'll have those deadlines too. Um, so the Deadline for all applications to the borough president, the Manhattan borough president and all other borough presidents is February 22nd at 5 p.m. Applications to the council are not due until March 21st, 5 p.m. Um, if you want to submit an application to both the council and the BP for the same project, that also needs to be, be in by the BP deadline of February 22nd at 5 p.m. Um, and if you wanna submit applications to DCLA, just to DCLA, that needs to be in by March 21st at 5 p.m. But if you want money from the BP and from DCLA, then your application needs to be in by February 22nd at 5 p.m. So it's really just those two dates. There's the February date, then the March date. Um, don't wait until the March date unless you really don't want to ask the BP for money. That's my, you know, that's my uh, suggestion to you. Um, so along with those dates, we will also update the site so that you can download the CAP grants application materials. Um, it will just be linked right from this main page. Uh, for those of you who have applied in the past, um, the materials are almost identical to what they've looked like in previous years. When you download the packet, you will see a... Um, you know, a, a, like a zip file that includes 33 documents like this. Um, it includes the guidelines and the bullet points to the guidelines, which are really just, you know, sort of the CAP grants eligibility rules, along with um, some other important information. It will include the actual application documents, um, for, both for your organization to apply and, and register yourself as an org eligible for funding and for the particular projects that you want to request funding for. Um, and it will also have uh, sample documents and examples that may be helpful as you're going through the process. So, so don't forget to look through everything very carefully when you download those. Um, like I said, we're going to put this up late next week. Um, so you should, can and should download this as, quick, as soon as possible and begin reading the application materials, begin filling them out, and begin in gathering the documents that are referenced in those materials. Um, I'm just going to very quickly show you what uh, one of these fillable application documents look like. Again, if you've applied in the past, you recognize this, um, but if you are new, please note that these are fillable PDF forms, um, which you'll need to obviously fill in the relevant information for your organization and project. And as you follow along on the form, um, you will be prompted to provide additional documents. Um, some of those are documents that are included in the, um, in the packet, but some will just be your own documents that you either need to find or that you need to put together. For example, here, um, if you were on page five of the organization form and uh, answering question D, you may be prompted to attach your document called 0.2 Articles of Certification or Incorporation, um, and you would just, uh, you know, you would know that you need that document. I actually... Uh, yeah, so you, you would know you would need that document and you would you would gather that. Um, so as sort of uh, alluded to, there are two segments of the application um, and you can see those you know materials in here that are relevant. There's what we consider the organization materials or the organization form and related materials. This is stuff that's um, general to your org. It's you know what what is your organization? what do you generally do? Um, what is your financial position like? And then the second section is the actual application for the project that you want funding for. Um, so you must do both sections. I will repeat that a couple times in here because every year somebody forgets to submit their application after they do the org stuff, but both are critical. Um, just note that each organization only needs to complete and upload the organization form and related materials one time, but you may be submitting multiple project applications if you have different projects you want funding for. Um, you know, you might be submitting projects to the council or the BP or whatever. Um, so you can submit, the system will not lock you out from uploading multiple applications, but you can only upload one organization. 
Turning back to our CAP Grants page here, um, you'll note there are some helpful links that right now are not quite up and running, um, but you will uh, have access to this how-to video, which will really just show you everything I'm showing you here today and more. Um, you can also access our CAP Grants instructions, which is just a PDF version, basically, of the video walkthrough. Um, here is our CAP Grants portal tab. As you'll notice, it is the portal is not up and running yet. We anticipate that the portal will be uh, live by the end of the first week of January, so something like January 6th. I don't remember exactly what the date is, um, that Friday. Um, but there's no reason you can't start filling out and gathering your documents before the portal goes live. Um, once it does, you'll have about a month and a half between the time you can start accessing the portal and when your application to the BP needs to be in. So that's quite a bit of lag time, um, quite a bit of time to get your application materials together and upload them. Please don't wait till the last minute to upload everything. Um, you know, we, we're pretty confident in the site, but there's always a possibility that things crash or get overloaded. So don't wait till the last day. I know almost everybody does, but you know, maybe this will be the year. Um, but this will be up and running and you'll have plenty of time. If at any point you run into technical difficulties, issues, just generally questions about how the site works, um, your elected officials, staff like Amy Nelson um, and their team or the council should be your first uh, you know, your first point of contact. Um, they can, they know a lot about this site too and probably can help answer most of the, the user questions. Um, but if there are things that need to, to come to IT staff or something, they can raise those issues. So, so please uh, reach out to them. Uh, if you have any questions. Once the portal is live, um, you can log in and see something that looks like this. This is actually just the testing environment, so the dates are not correct or anything, but it looks identical. Um, you'll notice that there are a few tabs across the top here, um, one for organizations, one for projects. Again, just noting that you have to upload organization materials and project materials um, separately, so don't forget to do the project stuff after you've done the org. Um, Oh, I got locked out. Sorry about that. Well, you can see here that um, you, you, this is the login page. If you if you um, used this site last year, this is last year was the first year we used this, what we're considering the new CAP grant site. But um, if you use this last year, your username will still exist and you, you can just log right in or reset your password if you need to. Um, and if you did not, you can register right here. I will say, um, that if you uh, registered or applied in, in a year before last year, when we had the old site, your information login would not have been ported over to the new site. So you'll just have to register again, but it shouldn't be an issue. Um, again, if you have technical issues, you can reach out to, to the Manhattan Borough President's team. Um, sorry about that. Okay. Now that we're logged in, we can see the organizations um, in my org tab. Most of you will only really register or have access to a single organization. There may be some people here who are uploading orgs for and materials for other organizations, you know, maybe your, your representative or something. Um, but for the most part, you'll just have one. Uh, these are just some various tests that I created. Um, but when you first log in, you will be prompted to either register a new organization or request access to an existing organization. So one thing that we did change um, from the old site is each organization can only be registered once. Um, and we challenge that by requiring each organization, um, the person creating the organization to enter the EIN number for that org, um, which as you can see is right here. Um, that's the employer identification number. So if you were to enter an EIN number for an org that already existed, pretty sure this is one, um, it would tell you something like this already exists. Well, I didn't do this. Yeah, you have already have access to an org with the CIN. That's not quite, I guess I use this for one of my tests, but it would basically tell you that already exists. Do you want access to that org? And the person who created it would um, have the ability to add you, which is great. Um, but if you are the first person to try to log in, to try to create this organization, you would enter your EIN, um, and you would also select whether your organization is cultural or anything else, non-cultural, as we say. Um, if you don't know whether you are a qualified cultural organization, please reach out to TCLA. I'm sure Darren will talk about that a little bit later. Um, but let's say for, for our example, you are a non-cultural organization. Once you, um, hmm, I just did the caption wrong. Sorry about that.
There we go. Uh, once you enter that information, you're prompted to fill out these fields with contact info. Um, you'll note that these are not technically required to submit your application, but it is really helpful for the elected officials and for um, the uh, eventual managing agencies for your project to have this info. So, so please do add that in. Um, once you add that, you will be taken to a page where you are prompted to upload all of your organization documents that you hopefully have already completed. Um, so th the documents in the required documents line here are ones that are required for every single organization. Um, the ones in the supplemental document section are may be required for you depending on how you have filled things out in your org form. And again, as you follow along in the org form, you will see which documents are required for you. Um, if you don't upload something in all the slots for the org form, um, you won't be able to submit your organization. If you don't submit upload something in a supplemental document slot that you your organization is required to do, it's not going to prevent you from uploading. Um, we don't really have the ability to do that, but somebody will come back and have to ask you to upload it. So try to, to follow along as closely as possible. Once you've completed your organization, um, you can go back here to the main page and see the one I just created is in a draft format, but when it's complete, it will show it's in a complete format. You will get an automated email sent to you indicating that your org is complete and that you um, now need to go submit your project. So you would come back to the site, go to the projects tab, and here you can create a new capital request or project. You can see I have a few tests here. Um, the process is, is very similar for um, uploading your project docs. You're going to first select the organization that you need, want to submit your project for. Again, it's you're probably only gonna have one. Here's my test org. And once you do this, you're going to select your application category. So this is just a, a, a little bit um, more specific uh, than just non-cultural or cultural. Here, you know, if you are a non-cultural, you're gonna tell us whether you are applying for a housing project, a charter school project, or anything else, which we call an all other project. Um, and once you select that, you will also select the type of project you're applying for. These are the things that Amy mentioned before, but it's either a construction renovation, uh, movable property equipment project, and movable property initial outfitting of a new space, a real property acquisition or a vehicle. So just for our example, we're gonna pick initial outfitting and advance to the next page. This um, looks pretty similar to what you saw on the org side. Um, you're going to have to enter in some information here like your project title, whatever you wanna call it, something helpful ideally, um, how much funding you are requesting. So um, the minimum funding amount for movable property projects is 50,000. We'll just put that for now. If you put something less, it will prevent you from uploading. You're gonna put in a, a small project description. It is character limited, but just put something that's helpful um, for the elected officials as they're reviewing. Um, you'll put your project location in here. Um, if you have more than one address, it will allow you to add multiple addresses. And here is where you actually select the elected officials that you want to request funding from. Um, it's very important that you identify the elected officials you want to see your application by doing this right here. It's not just in the application forms themselves. You actually have to add those elected officials in here or they will not see your application. Like when they log into their side of the CAP grant site, they just don't see your stuff. So please um, be sure to include the Manhattan Borough President and then identify how much funding you want from them. So for our example, we said this was a $50,000 project. Let's say we want 25K from the BP, and we also wanna request some money from the council. Um, you'll know all the borough presidents are listed here, but there's just one line for total council funding request. Um, you don't request individual amounts of funding from council members or delegations, you just request an amount from the total council. Uh, that is a little confusing and does trip people up, but just note that you can't even select council members until you've added council funding in. So we'll do this first, then we'll be able to actually add in the council members or delegations that we want to request funding from. So just, uh, you know, for example, we're going to say we wanted, uh, you know, we're in district two. Um, so now we will add that member, but, you know, we didn't actually uh, you know, set a dollar amount for, for from to request from her. So once we submit this, the borough president staff um, and 
the council member staff will be able to see this. Also, the council finance team, who is sort of the, you know, manages the process from their side. But if there are other council members um, who you ask about the project or you would like to fund the project, they're just not even going to see this. They're not going to know um, what the application is. So if you run into any issues like that, um, reach out to, you know, council members and we'll, we'll be able to, you'll be able to add new members to your project um, for them to look at it. Here you just upload the uh, both the required documents and the supplemental documents for your application as well. So um, try not to take up too much time, but once you submit your project application, it's going to look like this. Uh, it will say status submitted. Um, the BP's office will review your application. OMB will review your application um, if we're asked to. And um, if there are any issues that, that come up, um, we would communicate those issues to the borough president's office and they would forward them on to you. You should receive an automated email indicating that change requests have been made to your application, um, which would prompt you to come back here and see that there is something now in this messages section. So this project, no messages, but my example construction project, it looks like change requests were made. You can look at those by clicking on the messages button and seeing what um, the BP has asked you to change here. Um, it'll identify the exact documents that need to be uploaded. It will identify the exact changes you need to make. Sometimes these are pretty long. If, if there are a number of things you need to change or, or a lot you need to explain, um, it might be more than just a few words like this. Uh, they will also give you a deadline to submit by. Um, please try to hit those deadlines. It's very important to keep the process moving that you um, respond as quickly as possible to this, these things. And if you have questions about you know, the change requests that are submitted, you know, talk to the BP staff and they'll be able to walk you through it. Um, once you sort of understand what the change requests are, if you click back into your project here, you can see that the highlighted in red documents are the ones you need to change or upload. Um, so you'll be able to do that right here and then submit your project down at the bottom again. Um, that's really what I have for the CAP grants. Um, I am going to stick around for the Q&A to answer any questions about this website about cap grants process in general and about um, eligibility requirements for non-cultural and non-housing projects. Thanks very much. Awesome, thank you, David. Um, so Mason, you you okay? You ready to go next? And sure. We're, we're going to try to get to uh, Q and A as quickly as possible, so we can get through as many of the questions as we can. And I I was rather wordy, so apologies for taking as long as I did. But okay. Uh, it, it's very important information, and it's it's good to good to be. I didn't find you wordy, but it's good to be wordy because this is a complex, nuanced process. But that's what we're all here to help you through at the borough president's office, at EDC, at OMB, and other uh, you know city partners and city agencies. Uh, hi everyone again. My name is Mason Hess. I'm a vice president in funding agreements at the New York City Economic Development Corporation or NYC EDC. Happy holidays to everyone. Uh, this presentation is a bit. I, it's an overview. I could go much deeper, um, but I'm going to try to get through it in about 10 minutes, just in the interest of time and questions. Um, and so I'm going to share my screen now. And let me... Okay, can everyone see my screen? Sweet. So <clears throat> again, thank you for joining us today. And uh, thank you, Nelson and Amy, for inviting us to, to share our perspective uh, as a managing agency is how we implement these capital projects. And thank you for all the work you do to get these applications uh, processed and approved. Uh, it's, it's really a, a unique and wonderful program. So once uh, you submit a capital project into the capital grants portal and the borough president and city council and the office of management and budget uh, partners review the applications. Um, they are referred to uh, NYC EDC. Uh, well, some projects are, in particular, uh, projects <clears throat> that are uh, $500,000 or greater, and that are renovations, new construction, or property acquisitions in nature. Um, so that's what we, we focus on. Uh, EDC uh, and the other managing agencies like DDC or the Department of Cultural Affairs, DCLA, um, we do not make, well, DCLA technically does, but EDC uh, in particular does not make funding decisions. So we do not assist with applications. We do not review applications. Um, 
<clears throat> we also, again, are not involved in like actually awarding funds. We simply manage and implement the projects. So once your capital project is approved and allocated funds as of July 1, it's referred to NYC EDC funding agreements or FA. And a funding agreement is simply a contract that governs this process. Uh, the technical definition is here. Uh, it is a contractual mechanism to transfer city funds to a nonprofit to create or improve a capital asset that serves a public purpose. Now that's a dense definition, but again, uh, the important thing there is the FA or the funding agreement is simply uh, a contract and it moves your city funding application to you as a nonprofit for the capital project renovation, new construction or property acquisition. And the important thing here is it has to serve a public purpose. And one thing I wanna emphasize is that the capital grant application is incredibly important, not only for OMB, the BP, the city council to vet, um, but also uh, it lives with the project. And so that public purpose justification uh, has to be clear uh, throughout the life cycle of the project. And as we go through the process I'm about to overview and highlight, it's important that you stay true to your capital grants application. If you ever deviate from it too significantly by removing or adding scope or changing the location, as has been mentioned, um, you do have to sort of update your, you, you do have to update your application, uh, reapply, that causes, you know, obviously you'd have to wait to reapply and wait another year. And so whenever you submit an, uh, an application, make sure, you know, you really thought through and, and plan the project well, because uh, otherwise you can face project delays uh, by having to repurpose or reapply. Um, so the first step in our process is where these projects come from. Uh, as Dave and uh, Amy have shared, it's from the Capital Grants Portal or Cap Grants. Uh, the portal's open December, January. The application deadlines are in February and March, as have been discussed. And your funds are appropriated when the city's fiscal year starts uh, in, in on July 1. Important thing there to, to re-emphasize, as Amy shared, this program operates on a reimbursement basis, meaning that you have to incur the cost first. Um, and it's also important to note that you cannot incur costs before your funds are appropri appropriated on July 1. Um, if you start the project or incur costs before your July 1 award allocation date, um, those uh, project costs are not eligible uh, for reimbursement via this program. Um, then the process is essentially eight steps if you want to just kind of keep a mental map. And I also like to view it as sort of a hill or mountain. Um, and this is sort of the first trek up to the, the peak, if you will. So it's the first four steps, which are intake, legal drafting, and then the certificate to proceed or CP reviews. Um, and I want you to keep in mind that it's very important to keep in mind, uh, you know, all of the different stakeholders that are involved. It's the importance of preparing a good application, of preparing a, a project that's, that's well-developed because a lot of different entities and folks will be looking at this um, and reviewing and vetting this project. Uh, and it's also really important to keep in mind that when to know when it, the ball is in your court. To, to Dave's point, if there's an uh, when you submit your application, and if there's a question from the BP or the City Council office, uh, be aware of that and respond as quickly as possible. Um, so always know when the ball is in your court in this process, because everyone else is going to do their part and work really hard to keep things moving and to help and assist and guide you. But it's really important you also know uh, when when it, something needs to come from you or when you need to fix something. Um, intake is essentially whenever we refer to a new project, uh, we start intake, we collect a bunch of documents. I'll go over the list of those documents in a moment at the end of this presentation. Um, we essentially are preparing the city review and approval package. Uh, and the most important documents there are the narrative describing the scope of work and the budget, uh, which breaks down into, into cost and, and scopes and trade lines of the work to be done. We refer these documents then to city law. Uh, to draft the funding agreement contract and other documents as necessary. You, you have to have outside legal counsel to help you with this. Um, so once EDC, uh, you as an organization, your outside legal counsel uh, and city law all agree to these legal drafts, we then go to OMB. Uh, if you are a non-cultural project, you will have a pre-CP and a CP review. If you are a cultural project, you will go straight to CP review. And again, a CP is a certificate to proceed. It is a beautiful one-page sheet of paper that OMB issues that basically says that your project scope and budget uh, are in compliance uh, with city rules and requirements. Um, and that's, if you want to, again, picture a hill or mountain, the intake, legal drafting, and the CP review are sort of getting us to the peak. 
and we're there. Some considerations um, and some things that we'll vet as EDC project managers in particular uh, at the intake phase is that the project is fully funded. The city uh, for these capital projects is rarely, if ever, fully funding the project. We have to know that the project is fully funded and where the rest of the money is coming from. And that money has to be in hand. So executed grant agreements, executed loans, uh, received donations, not pledges or letters of support. Um, we're also going to vet all of these stakeholders, city law, OMB, and EDC will vet the capital eligibility of the project. Uh, you have to keep in mind that your project may entail an environmental review, and you may have to do that. You also have to pay prevailing wage on the entire project scope, not just the city-funded scope. So you have to pay prevailing wage on the entire project scope. Uh, if your project is large enough, uh, it's a $3 million trigger, you will have to have MWBE goals, which is um, minority and women and disadvantaged business enterprises. It's good to have those goals anyway, but if it, there is a requirement after a certain um, monetary threshold. I mentioned the need to have outside legal counsel just to help you through the construction process generally, but also specifically through the city process. And then if you decide to start your project after July 1, but before we've gone through the whole funding agreements process, um, you are doing something called going at risk. And what that means is because not all of the city stakeholders have signed off on your project scope and budget, um, we cannot commit that everything you want us to reimburse will be reimbursable. And so you that is a business decision on your part, but it is something to consider. Uh, we don't advise it, but it happens in reality in the real world. And we'll meet with you to discuss the pros and cons of doing that if you cross that bridge. Then going down the hill, going down the mountain, we will then execute the funding agreement. Uh, it's literally just executing any sort of contract. And then after it's executed internally at NYC EDC, we will then refer it to the comptroller, another city partner and stakeholder, um, to register the contract, just as you would register your city operating contracts. And after the, the FA is uh, registered, then there is really minimal risk, if any at all, and your projects are ready to enter the next phase, which is payments. So again, intake, legal drafting, the CP review, uh, and those are with EDC, intake is with EDC, legal drafting is with city law, uh, OMB is with the CP review, and then we execute the contract and we register it with the comptroller. Some things to keep in mind when you procure the contractor, the prime or first tier contractor to actually do the construction work, be that a general contractor or a construction manager, um, that, will, that entity will have to be competitively procured. You can't just hire someone that you're familiar with, a friendly firm, someone who's already like on an existing contract. You need to make a solicitation, make a good faith effort to get five bids or proposals, rank them, and then hire based off of that. Uh, you and the selected contractor, you as an organization and the selected contractor will have to provide employment reports and insurance. Uh, you will also have to have payment and performance bonds on the project, uh, in particular, the first tier prime contractor, but potentially other subcontractors as well. You as an organization and your procured firm will have to do a responsibility determination, which is essentially a high level city background check to confirm that you don't have any DOT, DOB, DEP violations, that you've paid your taxes on the property and that you're enrolled in Passport. And you also need a title insurance policy. Um, now, we're going really down the hill now. Before we start payments, which is the requisition phase, we do this sort of shadow phase that's called contract effectiveness. That's basically your EDC project manager due diligence in the contract and making sure that everything that's clearly stipulated in the contract as a prerequisite for entering into payments is, is on file, is correct, is, you know, that basically you're in good standing with the contract. It's really a uh, formality. And a lot of times we're, we're very proactive on making sure everything's collected and correct. Um, and then we enter into payments. And then there is a final separate, um, you know, milestone, which ends the process, which is contract closeout. And there's all of these phases and the required and associated documents and uh, rules associated with each are clearly documented in the contract. Some things to flag here, again, you need title insurance for this process, in particular before you begin payments. Uh, the budget will change, as has been mentioned in the uh, the two organizations that presented before. Uh, things come in cheaper, some things come in more expensive, there are change orders or unforeseen conditions on the construction project, and so your budget will change, and we need to be aware of those changes, we need to vet them and approve them, and again, we're trying to make sure that the spirit of the project that started with that capital grants application is going through all the way to the end uh, to close out of the contract and to final completion of the construction itself or the renovation itself. Uh, your building's certificate of occupancy is really important. Um, you have to make sure that it's basically compliant with the intended use of your, your capital asset. Uh, you will have to provide things during the requisition phase, like invoices, 
G702, G703s, uh, lien waivers and proof of payments, but lien waivers are very important from your contractors and subcontractors. Um, I've already mentioned the need for outside counsel because one of the things we will do before payments is to make sure that there's an opinion of counsel from your outside legal counsel, which is basically just a legal interpretation from someone else saying that they think the project's in good standing and ready to move forward. And finally, um, one thing to keep in mind is there's a declaration of restrictive covenant that applies to private property. So if you're not on city owned property, um, if you're on private property, regardless if you lease, rent, or own it, um, the city will place something called the Declaration of Restrictive Covenant in addition to the FA contract. That Declaration of Restrictive Covenant is a use lien. It is not a financial lien protecting the city's investment for the useful life of the asset, stipulating that that property must be used for the public purpose indicated in the capital grants portal. Uh, and the useful life of the asset per city rules is a minimum of five years, but a lot of times it can be longer than that, 10, 15, 30, or plus years. So it's a it's something important to keep in mind. It is a requirement for private property, um, and it's something that you just have to consider. If you're an organization that's going to consider this place home for a number of years and the useful life is not a problem, it's it should be an easy decision to make, but it is something to be aware of. Lastly, in the last minute or two, um, <clears throat> and apologies, I talk quickly and I'm going through a lot of material, but just wanting to give you a high level overview of everything that I think is important for you to know. Um, if you're doing a new construction, so building a new building or renovating an existing property at the EDC FA intake phase, so again, of our eight steps, it's step one, and it's the kickoff. And a lot of these documents follow the project through all of the city reviews um, and approval. So it's, it's really fundamental. The most important pieces are the narrative and budget. Narrative is a explanation and justification of, of you and the project, and then also a, a narrative and qualitative description of what work you're doing on the project. Uh, the budget breaks that out numerically and into trade lines and construction jargon. Uh, my team at Funding Agreements at EDC will do a site visit to meet your project team and for you to know us uh, will also it's really helpful for us to see the site and know what what space we're talking about and what work we're doing uh as i mentioned we need to prove that the project is fully funded outside of the city capital allocation and again those funds need to be executed and received not pledged or letters of support um the useful life certificates both from you as an organization and from your architect and engineer uh or, and architect or engineer and these are to establish the useful life of an asset. Again, the minimal useful life is five years uh, for capital construction. Uh, we also need your city operating contracts and a title report. If your project entails $2 million or more in city funding, you will have to consider the Green Building Standards Law. It may apply to your property. It may not, but it, that determination needs to be made by the architect, and it needs to be included in the building's design and construction. If you're leasing the property, we need to review that lease with city law and OMB as well as EDC. Your building, your project scope may trigger an environmental review. If it may not, but again, you need to make that determination with your design team and do what is ever applicable and document that. And again, it's good to do an MWBE plan by hiring MWBE certified contractors and subcontractors, but uh, there's a requirement if it's 3 million or more. And then of course, every project has its nuances and special considerations, and we may need more, but this is sort of the base list. Now, this is for new construction renovation. My last slide, I promise, is about property acquisitions. You'll notice all of this is the same. A narrative, budget, site visit, useful life letters, city operating contracts, a title report, environmental review, MWBE, triggers potentially, and other considerations. But for property acquisitions in particular, we need an appraisal of the property. The city cannot pay more than the appraised value of the property. We'll need a contract of sale, which is basically the, the terms of the deal between you and the current property's owner slash the property seller. And again, the certificate of occupancy is hugely important because we need to make sure that whatever, whenever you finish this project or purchase this property, the certificate of occupancy must be in compliance with the building's intended use. And one example is a lot of uh, folks will buy uh, a formerly uh, industrial use properties, buildings, and they have a CFO or certificate of occupancy for industrial use, but then they want to use them for something else, office, residency, uh, retail, et cetera. Uh, maybe those are bad examples, but just to note like that change there, um, you will have to make that change uh, as part of your, your project. So our contact information, uh, feel free to reach out to Amy and Nelson and they, they will, I'm happy to be put in touch with anyone here through them. 
Uh, but our direct email is fundingagreement at edc.nyc and funding and agreement are capitalized. So funding agreement at edc.nyc. If you also Google NYC EDC funding agreements, you can find our webpage, um, but here's the actual link. So that's all I wanted to share today. Thank you so much. That was that was really informative. Um, and we really appreciate all the really technical information that you provided Mason and David as well. Uh, I know that's really like the, the, the heart of what we're trying to help um, everyone here with today. And I know we've gone over and we care and respect everyone's time, yet we still have over a hundred participants. So we wanna um, get through um, most, if not all of these uh, questions. And um, so let's go maybe another 10 minutes, 15 max, and then we'll call it. Um, but like, like we've said multiple times, uh, you have our contact information, reach out to us directly and, um, we're available to help not just now, but for, you know, in the coming months ahead. So, so thank you. So I'm going to turn it over to Nelson. Who's going to moderate the questions. I've been attempting to answer some as they've been coming in. So if you okay. check the Q and a feature, there's, um, looks like there's 28 that are open. Some of them might be duplicates and we're going to try to go through those now and uh, Nelson will divvy that, those out, but some of them have been answered. So you should look in that tab as well. Okay. Um, and Amy, just keep me on point with timing and cut me off. Okay. Um, and number two, the panelists, if you're still on board, unmute so we can save two seconds there. Mm -hmm. Um, any exception to the $50,000 rule, David, correct me, but there isn't any exception no. and it only includes city dollars, correct? Yes. The minimum city funded portion of any movable property project is $50,000. The minimum city funded portion of any real property project is $500,000. Right. The projects okay. could be more expensive. But... Th thank you, Darren. If you're on, this is a tricky question. The next one that, that if we receive the, they made it to the 50000 but then they might get cut. It might bring them down. Is this an offline type of question, Darren? Not really sure. I totally understand the question. But if you're okay. talking about your CDF grant award, uh, as long as you have a panel recommendation from uh, DCLA, you're eligible to apply as a uh, cultural uh, organization. Oh, okay. that's true. Since it's a cultural, the 50K doesn't apply, right? Well, the 50K applies to the minimum. Uh, right, cost but not of the it. operating. But not okay. the operating. No, you just have to have a CDF panel recommendation or you have to be a member of the CIG group. Okay. Thank you, Darren. Next question. It's a tricky one, too, David. Um, they're in a <laughs> basement. This sounds, we, we, it sounds like we need to know a little bit more information about yeah, where I, the product. Go ahead. Right. I can't really answer specific questions that require a full application here. Right. Um, you know, I can answer more general questions. Um, this sounds like something you'll, you'll want to talk through with the BP's office. Um, you know, I think you're generally talking about religious use or or sites that are split between groups. I, I do want to just note, and I think it might get to your question, um, projects at lease sites are generally not eligible. Right. If we are talking about non-cultural and non-housing projects, um, if you are an all other type project, um, real property projects at lease sites are generally not eligible. But check the guidelines for the very, very few exceptions there. Okay, the next question, I'm not sure, but the, the, the Wall of President's offices do get an, an, a certain amount of um, capital dollars allocated. There may be other dollars you request from your council person, but there is an allocation. Next question for Enisha. I can answer that. I, I think what we should point out is that the funds that are allocated by our office are city funds, and it is our um, privilege that we've been granted as borough president to make those allocations at our, at our discretion. And we're given a specific dollar amount each year, but they are city funds. Next not que checks being cut by the borough president. Next question, David, can you answer? Isabel Thomas for initial, is it okay for if the space opens before February fiscal year 25 with temporary furnishings? Um, would they be reimbursed after the July 1st? I am aware these items may be purchased. So I'm not sure about the question, but it has to do about yeah. purchasing before the so, grant so, is allocated. Go ahead. 
this also sounds like a pretty specific question you'll want to talk right. about with the BP. Two important notes for initial outfitting. The whole purpose of an initial outfitting project is to purchase equipment to put a new space to you into service. If you're already using it, it's not an initial outfitting. Temporary okay. furnishings, that's not really meaningful from the perspective of, of the of the accounting directive that we follow. Um, so it's if you're not using a space, you furnish it, then you're able to use it. That's an initial outfitting. If it is um, already furnished, then you know new items you just want to put in there are not eligible. Next question, David. Security systems sounds like it would have to be part of a bigger application. Security uh, systems. I mean, it, I think it, that is you know a security system could be so many different things. Um, mm -hmm. I'm assuming this is a movable property. It's something that you are just kind of putting into a space and not built into a real property project. Um, you know, it has to hit all the same. Uh, requirements that every movable property project or does. It needs to be $50,000 minimum. It needs to be a system in and of itself, meaning all parts are connected at all times, either wirelessly or um, physically. So if you can meet those, there's no reason that something called a security system is ineligible, but you know, please take a look at the requirements. Next question, David, too. Seems like we need a little bit more context. Would bathrooms on a public plaza be considered a capital request? Um, that's... Generally? really tricky. I think if yeah. it is a public pro plaza, it's probably a city project that the city yeah. should be and would be doing. Um, I would talk to the BP's office about this, possibly to DOT. If you are a concessionaire at a DOT plaza, definitely talk to DOT about that. Most okay. likely it would be city capital for DOT, yeah. maybe parks. Yeah. yeah. It, it, Amy, next question. Is this something that they should just address with us when they are beginning okay, so this is, uh, they are a Friends of Parks group right. specifically for St. Nicholas Park. Um, what you should do is you need, you really need to talk to the Parks Department. You talk, need to talk to the Manhattan Borough specifically, their, their capital team. We have a close relationship with them. So you need to talk to them. They need to approve the project. You can apply either, either they can ask for it directly or you can ask for it on their behalf. But it has to be done with the approval of and in conjunction with parks. And the re repurposing applications, David, that's a checkoff in the application, but does it go through a full review? Um, yes. I mean, repurposing means you receive funding for a project and you no longer want to do that right. project. You want to do a different project. Um, so you will need to submit an application giving us all the information about your new project. Um, you really just tell us that you no longer want to do the first project and you want to move the money over. Um, so it still needs to be eligible. Um, occasionally people will submit repurposing applications that are not eligible um, and the money cannot be moved. But, uh, you know, just just note in your application that you intend to repurpose. And Amy, I'm going to jump down to the, can we apply for funds to complete one phase of a capital project or must be a completed project? Is there a timeline for when funds need to be spent and when they can be reimbursed, David? Um, I mean, some of this may be questions for EDC as well, but let me say from my perspective, the purpose of cap grants is not to you know, receive small amounts of money over many fiscal years to then allow you to do one big project down the road. Um, the idea is to apply for enough funds for a project that you can actually do um, given those fiscal years. Um, you know, I don't, there's not like a time frame in which funds must be spent for them to be reimbursed. It's more like, it often takes a long time to get to the point where you can be reimbursed. I think Mason really, you know, did a great job of explaining right. the whole process there. So you can, you know, refer to EDC on that, but but also jump in if you have something, Mason. Bio yeah, I was just gonna say, Go I was ahead, just gonna Mason. say really quick, our, our process to get from like intake to payments is typically about 18 to 24 months. Um, hence why some groups go at risk. So it does take a while. There's no timeline to spin it down, right? So like if you've got an appropriation and as long as you go through the process and everything gets approved, like your money is, you know, there. Um, what I would say though about the phasing is we, we in practice, we have had phased projects. It's really complicated because remember, if especially if it's private property, the declaration of restrictive covenant is going to like limit the property and protect the capital investment. So if you have to go into a second project that touches or undoes some of that previously protected work, that gets really, really hairy to tease out. And then the other thing too is keep in mind that even if that is not a consideration, 
Um, if you do multiple phases, you really need to close out the first phase before you go to the second phase, because, you know, sometimes groups get distracted by letting a project, a project languish. So they move on to another one. We don't like to do that. And, and then sometimes practically, if you have multiple contractors working on different phases, you know, that's a really difficult administrative burden for you as an organization to manage. So we really discourage phase projects and to Dave's point, just, if you know, you need to renovate a ton of stuff in your building, just like apply for that. <laughs> but, so. Thank you, Mason. Um, Biobus is not an open streets partner. I did ask her for that question. I'm going to jump down to the 30 years organization question, David. They still not eligible. They have to have history of managing city grants, correct? So you need you need city operating contracts in order to be eligible as an organization. Um, and remember, it's it's different for movable property as opposed to real property projects. Um, you, for a movable property project, you need at least uh, one year worth of city operating contracts that in in the amount of of twenty five thousand. So um, that it, you know the purpose of that requirement is to show us that you are a reliable city partner. Um, so, you know, if you don't have contracts now, I think in your interest in city capital, the goal should be to secure operating contracts to provide city services. Going to jump down to when requesting a 12 passenger van for a center, how do you navigate vendors who state the supply chain is limited and therefore won't provide a quote until the stock is updated? That sounds like a very specific question, okay. or specific issue. I mean, I don't believe anyone from DDC, um, the design and construction is on this on this call, but DDC manages um, the movable property projects like vehicles once funding is allocated. Um, they should be able to talk you through those steps. DDC has a great website with mm -hmm. all sorts of resources. They have contact information there. If you have any questions about movable property projects, that's the place to go. Next question, uh, an example of a minimally, minimally attached equipment. Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, always comes minimally up. attached items are things that are not permanently attached or considered fixtures built into real property. A good example is something that is screwed or nailed or like pasted in some way onto a wall. Um, it's something that if you're walking around in a building, you might say, this is, you know, this is not really part of the building, but it's connected. So maybe you have a television that's or a screen or something that's on a wall. That's it's not. A fixture it's just sort of a movable piece that you could take on and off um so I, I think those are good examples but there is there's more information in the application and in the the guidelines and and um the glossary of terms that would be helpful there amy i thought the next question we are interested in infrastructure upgrades at our neighborhood's public plaza can you try to how do we talk or work with dot Yes, yeah, so that was similar to the question I just right. answered about the with the parks group. Um, you should um, reach out to us, and if you don't have um, a person that you talk to at DOT, we can you know make that connection. But um, you know, you really need to speak with um, a, a, someone with you know decision making authority or approval authority um, at DOT. And they have to signal to us um, that they that they would approve the work if we make the funds um, available to them to do the work. Um, we we've done that several times in the past. It's um, so we can give you you know we can w walk you through that, but you'll want to talk to us directly. Okay, I jumped on a couple of slot a couple of questions down to Ava De Angelis. Um, because it's an MWBE question, and Mason and David, you both mentioned this, I think. Um, requirement for projects other than new construction and property acquisition no that's no okay no. movable property projects don't have mwb requirements okay um we we did an example cap grant is sending a message the process is closed how do i get where um for the application can people access the application to start looking at it you said david not yet um the application will go live at the end of next week um, so that will just basically be that cap grants download page. We'll uh, we'll have new information with the with the dates, and it will have a link for you to download the application materials. Um, so look out for that next week. Hey, this hey. is Darren. This is Darren from Darren, DCLA. Go ahead, Darren. Just to let you know that our application should also be available on our website by the end of next week. That's our goal. And just a reminder: culturals have a different application than everyone else. Thank you, That's Darren. an important reminder. I should yes. have said that before. Yeah. <laughs> Amy, I jumped on. I think the other questions are either answered or could be answered offline. Okay. All right. 
it's so back to you amy to close it okay out. Oh, well goodness. thank you everyone and um if, Sorry, again if there's a question that we didn't answer or you you feel like you, you have a follow-up to how we answered it uh, and, and everything else reach out to us directly and I want to thank everybody, every panelist and participant, specifically the our agency reps. Um, your technical knowledge is just invaluable. So we re and we really, really, really appreciate your time. And thank you to everyone that you know registered for the webinar. We look forward to talking to you in the months ahead. So thank you. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Nelson. Yeah. Bye, bye, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone.